We're going to do a three-week series called Vivid. And I'm going to tell you why Vivid. A series about all the spiritual disciplines in the Bible. There are roughly 18 of them. Now, as Pentecostal, evangelical, Protestant Christians, we basically know of maybe two or three. There are 18 roughly in the Bible. Now, I was talking to some of my guys, so we're gonna do a whirlwind tour throughout the Bible in the next three weeks. And we're gonna go through every one of them, 18. So when I was sitting praying, I said, God, how should I break it down? And this was just me. So I said, okay, God, uh, so we'll do six this week, then six next week, and the last week, six. Then I went, so that's six, six, six. And I go, mm, no. So today we'll do six. Maybe next week we'll do seven and five. Private joke, just thought it was funny in a church. So what are spiritual disciplines? Well, let me tell you what they are. They can be best described as those behaviours, listen to me, those behaviours that augment our spiritual growth, that add to our spiritual growth and enable us to grow to spiritual maturity with God and with others. And when we practise them, they'll help us develop. When we practise spiritual disciplines, here are some promises that God says He will give us. Listen to what it says in 2 Peter 1, 5 to 7. Now for this reason, also applying all diligence. Now right next to the word diligence, you can write the word discipline. Many people wanna to come to church, wanna be born again, and that's it, and never ever do anything else ever again, and saying, I'm born again, I'm saved. If I die to go to heaven, that may well be. But friends, God did not just save you for heaven. He saved you here for the earth to do a work for God, to build His kingdom, to do great things in the kingdom of God. I need an amen right now. So sometime next week, I'm gonna go sign some documents for a church that we're gonna take over in Benoni because you see, God didn't just save you for heaven. God saved you for a time such as now so that we can get busy getting people into the kingdom of God with the love of God and the hope of God and the faith of God. But you need to grow. You can't just sit back and say, let it happen. You need some diligence and discipline. The Bible says that when you apply all diligence in your faith, supplying moral excellence, and in your moral excellence, you will add to that knowledge. And in your knowledge, self-control. And in your self-control, you will have perseverance. And in your perseverance, godliness. And in your godliness, brotherly kindness. And in your brotherly kindness, you will end up with love. You see, friends, when we practice the disciplines and the things of God, we will grow in the things of God. Oh, I like Psalm 92, 12. It says, the righteous, the righteous man or woman, will flourish like a palm tree. He'll grow like a cedar in Lebanon. That means when you come into the church of God and you give your heart to God, you're a seedling. Turn to someone and say, it all starts with a seed. And if we root it in Christ, we will grow up. And our root being Christ, we will bear much fruit for the glory of Jesus. Who wants to see more of that in their life? Who wants to grow in more of those? There's a couple of people, I'm glad you're here. And for the rest of you, I'm also glad you're here. You're amazing. Turn to someone and say, you're amazing. Okay, that wasn't bad. I want you to really mean it now. Turn to someone else and say, you're amazing. That's it, I need you to talk with me today. It's a chilly morning. I'm standing up here sweating. You need to be praying for me. When I'm preaching, you need to be saying, amen, I agree with God. Let it be so in my life. If, I, if something slips out of my mouth that sounds biblical and that's good, and you say, man, I take that, I need you to say amen. Can we practice that? One, two, three. Whew. Some vibrancy over here. So here's the word vivid. Why did we use the word vivid for the next three weeks? Because not only does it mean something visually appealing and stimulating is what the modern world thinks it means, but watch some of the synonyms of this word. It's dynamic. It's striking. It's strong. It's powerful. It's fiery. 
It's lively, it's animated, it's spirited, it's vibrant, vital, vigorous, and energetic. That is exactly what God wants to do in your spiritual life. He wants it to be vivid, full of power, full of life, full of hope, full of glory, full of anointing, full of God. Amen. Can you say amen? No, but you've got to do it like that. Say amen. Amen. Very good. So, in the last week, I said to you that for most of us, prayer and Bible reading are the only two spiritual disciplines that we practice. And some of us don't even practice those two very well or very much. We're gonna talk about those in the last week. So today, let's look at some guidelines for all spiritual practices found in the Bible. All of them always help us to grow closer to God. Number two, they flow with and will always agree with God's Word. You will never practice something in the Bible that will be contrarian or contradictory to the Word of God. Amen? If it's not in the Word, don't practice it. Can I give you an example? Who'd like an example? Does anyone have a can of doom here? Do we find people being sprayed in the Bible with a can of doom? Do we find it in the Bible? Should it be done in a church? Does anyone have a small light vehicle outside? Put up your hand. You're very scared now. I take people going, because you're thinking, I go, bring the keys. God bless you. Thank you so much, my sister. That building project awaits. We're going to have an auction here next Saturday. You can see everyone going, whoo. Pastor, you saw that? I see that hand. I see that hand. I see that hand. I see that hand. (laughs) So imagine I said to you, after the service, everyone has problems in their body, go lie outside on the floor. We're going to just drive the car over you. It happens. Do we find that in the Bible? No. Luckily, it's winter and the grass is beginning to die. But there are some churches that practice eating grass for healing. Do we find it in the Bible? All spiritual Practices are found in this word. Anything that is contrarian is not to be practiced. Can I get an amen? I'm still waiting. Anyone with a can of doom? Come up afterwards for some prayer. By the way, it also doesn't mean you can use deodorant. Okay? All spiritual practices help us mature. They help us grow and they don't confuse us. When we practice them, we grow. We don't become more confused because of them. They bring joy to us and others and ultimately God. Um, And we're gonna be looking at this study. If you really wanna go a bit more in depth, I've got this great book by Richard Foster called The Celebration of Disciplines. Richard Foster, if you really wanna get into the 18 uh, spiritual disciplines, it's by a guy called Richard Foster called The Celebration of Discipline. And here we go. Let's get into them. We're going to do six today. Somebody say, here we go. So number one, the very first discipline we find in the Bible, or the one we're going to start with, is called the discipline of the with God life. Let me explain to you. Matthew 23. Matthew 23, sorry, 1 verse 23 says, The virgin will conceive, this is the mother of Jesus, and bear a son. And they shall name him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. God is with us. Now this practice, the name Emmanuel, meaning God is with us, is a title given to the one and only Redeemer, Jesus, because it refers to God's everlasting intent for human life. Namely, that we should be in every aspect a dwelling place of God. Listen to what Luke 17, 20 says, the kingdom of God is amongst you. You see, friends, the Bible teaches that there is the priesthood of all believers. In other words, the Bible says we are all royal priests. Do you know what the Bible says? The day you are born again, the Holy Spirit comes to dwell in you. 
There is not a different Holy Spirit that dwells in a pastor. There are different outflows and functions for sure. But it is the same Holy Spirit that lives in me, that lives in you, that resurrected Jesus Christ from the dead. And friends, here's something to practice. There was a guy called Brother Lawrence. And Brother Lawrence about, I think two, 300 years ago, wrote a book called The Presence of Christ. And he had quite a revolutionary thought. He said, you know what? Instead of just always thinking of God when we go to church, what if, someone say, what if we went to work and we were mindful of Jesus? What if we went home to our families and we were mindful of Jesus? But not only in our homes, while we were doing the dishes, while we're cutting the lawn, while we were doing menial tasks, we would always know that the very presence of God is with us. I have a great story. My father-in-law told me once, he said, he would drive in the car and he would never put his briefcase. He worked for the Bible Society, traveled South Africa, high and low, spreading the Bible in many churches. And I said to him, Dad, tell me a little bit, what was that like? He said, oh, it was a wonderful experience. And I'm paraphrasing now. And he says, I never used to put my briefcase on the passenger seat. I said, why? He says, because while I was driving, I would keep the seat open for Jesus. See, that's a beautiful thought. That while I'm driving, I'm communing with Jesus. While I'm living life in my marriage, I'm doing it with Jesus. Wherever I go and I'm raising my children, I'm doing it with Jesus. Not just 10.30 to 12 on a Sunday morning, but in my small group, in my work, when I go to the gym, it is the with God life and God with me and I with Him. My whole life is about God. Everything I now do is spiritual, not just prayer, not just reading the Bible. My work is spiritual. My family is spiritual. The way I speak is spiritual. The way I love is spiritual. The people at work I pray for, it is spiritual. My recreational time is spiritual because I'm doing it with God. Paying my taxes is spiritual. There was one amen over here. Only one amen in this whole church. There's one amen at the back. Three. Do you know the Bible says we must obey the law of the land? <laughs> no amens. Okay. We have a lot of teaching to do still out of the Bible. Can I get an amen? The kingdom of God is amongst you. It takes discipline to practice like that. Because you know the other, the inverse of the God with us life is this life. The me, myself, I life. So when I'm in church, Preach up, preach to me about me. God, when I open up this Bible, don't tell me what you wanna do, just tell me what I want to hear. When I go to work, it's all about me. And my wife, she's there for me. My children are there for me. The government is there for me. And everything I do in my life all revolves around me because I am the new God. I am the new idol. And I will only worship me. See, because that's the natural inclination of human beings outside of God. Me, me, me. Or me, myself, and I. The unholy trinity. The God with life requires discipline. Jesus is with me. Jesus is here. How must I behave how would he behave? What would he say? What would he do? How would he act? Who would he be? And he is with me and I am with him. It takes discipline to live like that. Who's gonna start practicing that life? There's a couple of hands. Give yourself a hand, well done. Number two, moving right along on this whirlwind tour. You know, in praying, I said, God, should we do an 18 week series on spiritual disciplines? We could It'd take 18 weeks. Nonetheless, we are here now doing it this way. Number two, the discipline. Here's a novel one. Read that with me. The discipline, put it on the screens. The discipline of 
Celebration. Do you know that that's in the Bible? It's a good thing to celebrate. It's a good thing to celebrate. I find so often in this modern world that we live in, whenever we get success or victory, we quickly move on without saying thank you, Lord, without stopping and having a feast to say, God, we honour you. One of the things the Americans did well is they instituted a public holiday called Thanksgiving. And it was rooted in the practice of saying, Lord, because of you, we are here. Because of your blessing, you have helped us. And I think it ought to be a wonderful thing in your family that not only when the Springboks win a Rugby World Cup or Bafana Bafana win the Africa Cup of Nation or whenever our cricket team does well, now and then we celebrate. What if, what if we made up our minds to celebrate every time God gave us a victory in our life, not based on sport, but based on His goodness, His mercy, His love, His grace, and who Jesus and the Holy Spirit are in our lives. Imagine we threw a party because God was God and we honoured Him. Hey, isn't that a great idea? Didn't mm. someone say, mm. just, if it's your wife, it's okay. If it's a stranger, just smile. Put your thumb up. The discipline of celebration. Listen to this. It's the practice of utter delight and joy in ourselves, our life and our world as a result of faith and confidence in God's greatness, God's beauty and God's goodness. Goodness me, that's good. Hey, maybe next time God does something wonderful for you, throw a party. Nehemiah, 52 days, they build a wall around Jerusalem. They call it a party. Say, look how good God is to us. He helped us build a wall in 52 days. What seemed impossible for man is always possible with God, let's throw a party, let's throw a party. Here's a couple of things. Imagine in South Africa, we could defeat the spirit of racism, the spirit of poverty, the spirit of brokenness, the spirit of complaining, the spirit of moaning. I think, my view only, if there was a World Cup of complaining and moaning, where do you think South Africa would end up? We would be the best ever. New Zealand would have to come to us with their mighty team. Yeah, come out there, come out there. And you know, all that stuff they do. We'll go like, it's not good enough. You don't scare me. Check out Frote Luca. We just defeat them right there. We'd win that every single year, hands down. We wouldn't even try. Chin Brew, come on, Brew. We complain with the best of them. Who are you Americans, Brew? You think they can beat us? We'll out moan them before they get on the plane. Donald Duck. Something interesting, just something interesting, totally off key here. Do you know that America is run by a president with the first name of Donald and the vice president's name is Mickey? Little did Walt Disney know that America would be run by Mickey and Donald in the year 2017. Just something for you to think of. Psalm 145, 7, listen, the celebration of discipline. They shall celebrate the fame. Oh, I like that. Not the fame of our rugby team. Praise God for them and our soccer team and our cricket team. Not the fame of our political leaders and praise God, we pray for them. We bless them. We believe God is gonna help them. Can I get an amen? But listen to this, they shall celebrate who? The church, the people of God shall celebrate the fame of your abundant 
goodness. Oh, I like that. The fame of your abundant goodness. Not Hollywood, not Tom Cruise, not whoever, but the fame of your abundant goodness and they shall sing aloud of your righteousness. Oh, how good is that? The fame of God. Philippians, the famous verse. Philippians 4.4. Rejoice in the Lord. Sometimes. Rejoice in the Lord. Again, I say. Do you want to learn what rejoice means? Who wants to know what rejoice means? I need at least one hand to answer that. Thank you. There's a couple of hands. Stand to your feet. You're going to learn to rejoice. You've got to stand to your feet. I really meant that. I wasn't joking. You're going, no, Pastor, this isn't what we normally do. I know. It's okay. Can I, I don't know. Is, do we have someone on drums? Do we get someone on drums? If the drummer's left, that's okay. Then we get someone on keyboard. If he's left, we'll get someone on, on the guitar. If he's left, I will just do it with God. Amen. So the word rejoice means this. Thank you. Everybody say hello, Benjamin. That's Ben on keys. Always wanted to say that. You know, you get Alicia keys. This is Ben keys. So check this. And you know what's beautiful? I'm just being facetious now. When you look at a keyboard, such a lovely representation of a nation working together. White and black keys working together in unison making a lovely tune. We should make the zebra the national animal. So the word rejoice, church, literally means this, that when you come into the house, of the Lord, there's a joy that is so exuberant and so powerful and so over, overpowering that you cannot help yourself. Go study the Greek word. It means that the joy of the Lord fills my life that I can't stop but rejoice. Ing, there's something in me that I can't stand still. I gotta rise to the King. So on the count of three, right there where you are, don't go too high. Must scare someone next to you. On the count of three, I'm gonna shout the word rejoice. And if this is your first time, just do one of those. And if you're a exuberant and a very experienced rejoicer, go for it. But watch your landing. So on the count of three, I'm gonna shout rejoice. And if you can't jump, just lift your foot. And if you can't lift your foot, raise your hand. On the count of three. Is there a buzz in the house of God? Are you ready to rejoice before God? One, two, three, rejoice! <laughs> oh, that was good. I've got to do it again. One, two, three, rejoice! One, two, three, rejoice! Give yourself a praise. Thank you, you may take a seat. Thank you, Ben Keys. Ladies and gentlemen, give Ben Keys a hand. So that's what it means to rejoice. I'll use my body. I'll use my life to celebrate God. Isn't that beautiful? You know who taught that to me? The late doctor, Miles Monroe in a church in Pretoria. I went to go and attend that service. What an amazing man of God. And he taught us that. Number three. I'm trying to rejoice and catch up from rejoicing. Living with God is an exciting and adventurous life. Here's a very different one, a very novel one. You won't, you won't hear this often in the church. We live in a world that has gone sex mad, sex crazy. We live in a world that's saturated with sex. It's in our adverts. It's uh, when we drive on the roads, there are adverts for clubs where men, can go do things that are untoward. Oh, this discipline would bring us back in line for the things of God. The discipline of chastity. I'll explain what that means. Listen to this. Purposefully, and by the way, sexual intimacy is for marriage only. Can I get an amen? Young people, I want to encourage you. 
Wait till you're married. You know why? It's going to be a lot more fun. Can I get an amen? It's gone very quiet. It sounds like the tithe and offering message. See people doing this now. It's okay. We'll get through this. I promise 12 o'clock I'll let you go. But while you're here, let's talk. So listen to this. It says, purposely turning away for a time from dwelling upon or engaging in the sexual dimension of our relationship with the, with the other, even the husband or wife. And thus learning how not, watch this, I love this, how not to be governed by this very, very powerful aspect of human life. By the way, just in case you're wondering, God made sex. It's one amen, thank you so much. Everyone else thinks it's the devil. And the reason they think it's the devil, because he, this is by the way how evil works. The devil takes anything that is good and corrupts it for wrong. Evil can never ever stand on its own. What does it mean? Evil is a parasite. Evil is a tick. And it can never be evil without something good first. So here's the discipline of chastity. You won't hear this preached in churches because it's almost as if sometimes in the church we go with the culture of the world. 1 Corinthians 7, 5, and guess what? I told you we would not practice anything if it's not found in the Word. Can you believe this verse is in the Bible? I say amen. Do not deprive one another except. So this is now talking about sex within marriage. Paul is writing to the church. And now listen to him. Except perhaps by agreement for a set of time. And listen why you would do that. To devote yourself to fasting and prayer. The Greek word for your body is soma. And when you practice this, you are saying, and by the, word, by the way, the word soma means slave. And you are saying when you practice this, slave, you work for me. You do what I say. I do not do what you want and you say. You obey me as I obey God. Isn't that interesting? Can I get an amen? Don't leave me hanging here, please. Thank you very much, church. You're beautiful. What a beautiful image. Creates a vibrancy and love and passion within the marriage. It's important to mix things up in the marriage. You can't have ice cream every day. All the time, 20 times a day. Who likes ice cream? I've tried to quit since a youngster. I just haven't been able to give it up. It's very hard. But how wonderful is ice cream when you haven't had it in a long time? The flavors are so much sweeter. The intensity is so much more beautiful. And God knew this. But in the world we live in, it's all the time, anytime, 24-7, 365. What a beautiful discipline for marriage. Isn't that wonderful? And note, by agreement. Can we move on? The discipline of confession. The Bible says, listen here, this is what it is, sharing our deepest weaknesses and failures with God and trusted others so that we may enter into God's grace and mercy and experience and experience, listen to this, his readiness to forgive and healing. Isn't that beautiful? Psalm 38, 18 says, I confess my iniquity and I am sorry for my sin. Isn't it amazing in the world we live in? Never mind South Africa, the world we live in. Leaders have a problem in saying sorry. Hey, I don't know how your mother and your father raised you, but my mother and my father when they raised me, they said, when you do something wrong, you must say sorry. We live in a world today where people just do what they want and they don't ever confess. It's as if nothing's wrong, let's just carry on. But not, that's not what the Bible says. James 5, 16 says, therefore confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. Healed of guilt, healed of hurt, healed of brokenness, healed of sickness. Do you know that they reckon 70, maybe even higher, 70 to 80% of people in hospitals are not there as a direct result of sickness. 
They are there as a direct result of emotional hurts, hang-ups and habits that have gone wrong in their life. And the result is sickness. And isn't it amazing that the Bible says, therefore confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. What a beautiful promise, church. Yes, give God a hand. Two more. The discipline of fasting. Listen to this. The voluntary abstention from otherwise normal functions. Most often eating for the sake of intense spiritual activity. Now, I want to say this. There have been many books written on this. I think the, the modern tendency, which I don't, I don't see in the Bible, the modern tendency is let's fast to make God do something. Whenever people fasted in the Bible, God did something because He's good, not because they were fasting. It was God doing it, not their fasting that caused God to do it. You're hearing what I'm saying? It's almost today as if we're going, let's twist God's arm because when we fast, now He must. God doesn't have to do anything. He's God. You go and understand the dictionary definition of God, meaning He decides. The Bible says, I think in the book of Job, who does God go ask for counsel? No one, because He's God. So when we fast, we are fasting for ourselves. We are fasting to grow closer to God. We are not fasting to lose weight. Some on this Daniel fast. I have lost four kilograms in one week. Wow! Wow! So when did God speak? What did God tell you? I don't know. I just lost four kilograms. And those lemons and oranges are delish. Wow! Wow! Summer's coming. I'm going on a, I know the Bible says it's a 21 day fast. I'm doing the whole 40 day. I'm doing a new Daniel dimension. It's like Daniel, but double. <laughs> yeah, it's fun because summer's coming and you know what I'm saying. <laughs> and people are like, we got to fast because we need to lose weight. Well, how about fasting because you love God? How about fasting because you want to hear God speak intensely, deeply, powerfully, anointedly into your life and you'll hear Him. So fasting, Joel 2.15 says, Blow the trumpet in Zion, sanctify a fast, call a solemn assembly. Matthew 4, 4, ah, oh, I like the words of Jesus. And the devil tried to tempt him. He was hungry on a 40 day fast. And the devil says, turn these stones into bread. And Jesus answered, oh, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Let me eat his words. Let it sustain my life. Let His words be the anchor of my soul. Let what He says direct my path. Let what He says be life to my spirit. Mm. How's that for a meal? Hey, remember what I taught you in chastity, Soma. Slave, listen to me as I listen to God. You will not control my life. I will tell you when to eat. You are not my master. You are my slave. That's what the word body means. And you'll notice new age says you ought to live your life in this order. Body, mind, spirit. That's the order. Saying your body rules you. But the godly way is to say I'm ruled by my spirit, which affects my mind, which touches my body. The body comes last. Everything starts in the spirit if you're a Christian. If you want to live the other way, not so good. And now the last one before we close. Who's enjoying? Are you getting something this morning? Did you know the Bible was so rich and deep? This one person said, amen. Thank you. The discipline of fellowship. Do you know that in this church, there are 72 different small groups. Open small groups, meaning there are groups you can go and join and fellowship with, no matter who you are. Then there are closed groups that say, Pastor, you know what? I'm not ready to open up my home. I'm not, I'm not there yet, but I, they're called a closed fellowship because I want to meet with my family as the head of this house or uh, whoever's the head of the house, the mother or the father. Um, 
talking also single parents here, saying, you know, we, I want to teach my kids. And we want to have a group. But here's the thing. Fellowship is a discipline. Why? Because the very other way we go is selfishness. Selfishness, it's easy to sit at home. It's easy to turn on the TV. It's easy to sit back and eat the chocolates and the popcorn and just veg in front of the TV for four to five hours. You see, when you're disciplined in fellowship, you got to get dressed and you got to go wash your face and you got to look in the mirror and brush your teeth and spray on some nice smelling uh, uh, deodorant and you got to go out the house. You got to get in the car. You got to drive somewhere. Might cost you your petrol. Might cost you time off your cell phone and WhatsApp and put that off and putting off the computer and putting off the radio and putting off whatever other device you have to now go and engage with other Christians around the things and the kingdom and the person of Jesus Christ. You see, that's a discipline, just like you were disciplined enough to get up this morning and come to this church, get dressed, get in the car and say, I will not neglect the fellowship of the brethren. I need to be in the house of God. When the fire falls, I want to catch it. When God speaks, I want to hear. And when it happens, I am there. That requires a discipline in your life. The Christian life is not an untoward and wanton life. It is a disciplined life under the power of the Holy Spirit of God. Hallelujah. Listen to this. Fellowship. Engaging with other, and I don't like this, it says not just anyone, disciples of God. Not just followers, not just people that come to church, people that have brought out the time to follow Jesus. A disciple and a follower are two different things. Disciples in common, activities of worship, study, prayer, celebration, and service which sustain our life together and enlarge our experience for more of God. Ah, Matthew 18, 20, where two or three are gathered in my name, God says, I am there. I am there. I made up my mind, that's a promise from God. If you'll come to the meeting, I'll be there. If you'll come and fellowship with other believers, I'll be there. I'll come every single time. I'll never skip once. If you skip, I'll still be there. If you stay at home, I'm still going. I want you to come along because I'm not gonna drop you. You might drop me, but I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. I am going and I will be there. Don't miss out because what I'm gonna do is but different in the group from what I'm gonna do with you personally in your house. When you come to the group, I'll work in a way that's slightly different from what you get when you're alone in your home. But when you come to the group, I'll do something new. I'll do something fresh. And I will always go if you go. That's what God's saying right there. Hebrews 10, 23 to 25. Let us consider how to provoke. Oh, this is a good Scripture. The Bible, God is so smart when He wrote the Bible. He's always been smart. He's always been wise. He's the all-knowing one. He's the omnis omniscient one. Listen how it says that. Let us consider, let us think how to provoke. See, the word provoke is often used in a negative way. You provoke me to anger. Oh, but listen to this. Let us consider how to provoke one another to love. Provoke others to love, to forgive, to be good, to share, to be kind, to be hopeful. Let's provoke one another, church. That's why we exist, to love and to do good deeds and not, and not, someone say, and not neglecting to meet together. And if you carry on reading, it says, as some have done. Let's provoke one another to love. Oh, I like that. That's good. In the world we live in, people are trying to provoke one. There's the word provocateur. It's a word for an agent, an agent, an agent of evil. You've heard of Dr. Evil. He has people called provocateurs. They are agents of evil. 
evil. They try and get you to do wrong things and think of wrong things. Let's be provocateurs of love. Let's be agents of God, of peace, of hope, of blessing, of power, of anointing, of healing, secret agents of God. Turn to someone say, look at someone say, don't say I'm gonna kill you now because that's how they talk. Say I'm gonna bless you now, but I'm actually a secret agent of God. See, some of you are very scared to turn around to someone there. It's okay. Who's learned something this morning? Don't miss next week. It's gonna be vivid. There's still another 12 disciplines like this to enrich your spiritual walk with God. It's not just about prayer and Bible reading, which is very, very important. We're gonna talk about that in the last week. I want you to stand to your feet. Just wanna encourage you this morning. This Saturday coming, if you're not a member of this church, nine o'clock, I'm gonna provoke you to fellowship. Put down your name at the iDesk and say, I wanna be part of this church. I wanna go through the process. I wanna know how to get involved. How do I join this thing called the church? Nine o'clock, we're gonna have a short morning of provoking you to fellowship, love, on the things of God. Right now, before I pray any other prayer, if you believe this morning, and I mean this sincerely, if you believe God's spoken to you this morning about any one of those disciplines, would you lay your hand on your heart? Or would you close your eyes? And would you thank Jesus right now for speaking to you? And ask God to help you to live the life. There's a lot more to Christianity than just coming to church. There's so much more that God wants to do with your life so much more. He's training you for reigning to live like Jesus. He is. He really is. He really is training you to live like Him. You're an agent of hope. You've heard of a dope dealer? You're a hope dealer. You're a dealer of love. You're a dealer of peace. You're a dealer of mercy. You're a dealer forgiveness. Let's not promote the other stuff. Let's promote who we are. You're a dealer of God. You hand Him out wherever you go. You share Him with whoever wants to love Him. And those that reject Him, you even bless them. You share love even with the enemies of God and you. People are astounded when you walk into the room because they don't get you, but God does. They don't get you. They don't get how you work who you are, you're sons and daughters of God. You don't belong belong to this kingdom. You're of an eternal kingdom. Mm. When people look at you, they don't get you because you don't operate by the rules of this earth. You operate by the law of love and the Holy Spirit. Truth and the Spirit guides your life. You're a person of faith. When everyone else is complaining, you're encouraging. You're stepping in saying, we're gonna make it because God is good. Doesn't matter what they say, it matters what He says. While every head is bowed and every eye is closed,